we go. Okay, great. You ready for me to start? I'm ready for you to start. All right. Welcome, everybody. I'm so excited to be here and talk to the master naturalists of Forsyth County. And um, I, uh, Heather just introduced me just a little while ago. But uh, again, for those who may have joined after that, my name is Holly Campbell, and I am part of what's called the Public Service and Outreach Faculty at the at UGA at the Warnell School of Forestry and Natural Resources. And in my role there, I focus on urban forestry and wildfire and prescribed fire education. I also teach undergraduate classes. One of the classes I teach is called dendrology. It's a, well, I teach the lab of dendrology. And that is our tree ID, tree um, biology lab. It's very exciting. I'm also an avid wildlife watcher and I'm a beekeeper. And I was a gardener for about 15 years. And I focused in part on creating wildlife habitat gardens for people. So uh, this is all within my wheelhouse and an interest area of mine. So our webinar today, Georgia Trees and the Wildlife That Love Them, is gonna primarily cover tree identification, but we're also going to discuss several Georgia species that attract wildlife. Okay, so there's no way we can cover all of the important wildlife attracting trees can't get in Georgia. It. Okay, if everyone could just mute themselves, um, maybe I'll, yeah, thanks. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, so we're gonna try to cover as many species as we can, but I won't be able to cover all of them. Um, and we're gonna start just by gauging your knowledge of tree ID. And so we're gonna do a few polls. And our first one, just let me um, get this set up. I'm going to assess just kind of your overall tree identification knowledge. So I'm gonna launch the first poll and you'll see it on the screen. All you need to do is click on what applies to you. So what is your level of Georgia tree identification knowledge? Are you an expert? You're not an expert, but you have a good working knowledge or you know a little, or I have absolutely no tree ID knowledge. I'm just going to leave it up for just a, just a second. You guys have got this down. I like this. Okay, so it looks like we've got oh, about half of the class, you know, says that they're not an expert, but they have a good working knowledge. And then we have about 50% of the class that knows just a little bit. And then 3% or of the participants rather you don't have any ID tree knowledge. So this is gonna be a great webinar for everybody. So let's go to the next poll. Let me get our next one out. Sorry, I'm gonna be a little rusty on this. So let me get this. Okay, let me move this over here. Okay, so here is the first tree that I would like you to chime in on. Now, this is a very common tree. People plant this in their yard, but it's also a native tree. Um, it can get to be 60, 70 feet tall. Uh, this is a very typical uh, form of the tree, 90 degree branch angles to the trunk, um, sort of elliptical leaves. It has these fruits um, that occur in the summer, spring, and maybe linger into the fall, and wildlife love them. Okay. So looks like we've got some good guesses here. Um, and I think that the majority wins here, 53%. This is a black gum tree called Nysa sylvatica. Nice job, everyone. All right, let's go to our next tree. Let me launch the poll again. And I'm gonna move this over here so you can see the image. It's a very common native tree, has a huge range across the East Coast. And a lot of us have played with these little fruits of the tree. Um, several of you probably have these either in the woods or around your house. Just a few seconds more and we'll close out the poll. Okay, so <clears throat> here were our results. I'm getting this down now. Um, some folks said sweet gum, some people said sugar maple, and this is indeed a red maple. And so we got the majority here that felt that, then that's great. Okay, and we're gonna do one more final poll. 
And so here is our next tree. This is a great wildlife species. Move this over here. Okay, and so what is this tree? Now this is the bark of the tree. And we've got these great berries. This is a native tree, that should help. And we're gonna talk a little bit about this tree later. And I would say that uh, we're getting some good responses here as far as people know this tree. Very nice job. Okay, I'm gonna close out the poll and I'll share the results with you here. This is indeed an Eastern red cedar, very common um, native tree and very beautiful tree. And uh, Nice job, everyone. Okay, and I go out of that. All right, so sometimes, I'm gonna actually turn off my video here just in case we get some uh, internet lag. Sometimes video can, can slow the internet down, so I'll turn mine off. All right, all right, so <laughs> tree ID can sometimes feel daunting and it's, it's good to know where you can begin. And having a few ways to get started is sort of the first step. So let me give you some tips from what I have learned. So this, again, this is, we have a one hour webinar. There's only so much that we can talk about in an hour on Tree ID. This could easily be a full day workshop, but the tips I'm gonna give you will enable you to be able to gather enough information to try to narrow down what a tree is, either in your yard or out in the woods. And so what I'm gonna teach you are what we're calling brief identifiable features. And then we're going to learn some common native trees in the Piedmont area, which is where both of us live. And then we're also gonna discuss animals who rely on these species. And getting started though in tree identification, you need clues. We all have to use our sleuthing skills and become Sherlock Holmes. And so there's a few clues. I encourage you to have a notebook handy when you're trying to ID a tree, a pencil or a pen, and a camera, either on your phone or a camera where you can just take images. So tree ID, you first wanna think about, well, where is this tree located? Where is it located in the country? Where is it located in the state? Is it in the mountains or is it down on the coast? Is it in a natural area? Is it in someone's yard or an urban area? And so just looking at geographical location is important. Then you wanna think about the shape of the tree. Is it a, does it have a broad crown like a mature oak? Does it have a conical crown like a young Leyland cypress or a young Eastern red cedar? Or does it have sort of a spreading sprawling crown? What's the estimated size of the tree? What's the, you know, if you could make a guess, people oftentimes <laughs> misjudge height and width. I'm the same, the same way. Um, I have a difficult time unless I have measurement tools, but generally you can make a difference between a 20 foot tall tree and a 100 foot tall tree or have some variation. It's either small, medium or large. So getting that general idea of its, its size. You also wanna consider the site. Is this a site that's dry? Um, is it a site that tends to drain water slowly? So is it wetter? Is it a site that has more sun or shade? Now, sometimes in some people's yards, they might plant trees in the wrong, we call it, <laughs> we try to encourage people right tree, right place, but sometimes trees aren't always placed in the right location for their preferable habitat. And so again, just notice where this tree is located and make note of that. So we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into the brief identifiable features. Leaves are the easiest place to start. So if you wanna start learning tree ID, now is a good time, but as the leaves start to fall off, it gets a little more challenging. Um, spring is a good time and summer. So you know, if you wanna take some information you learn from this webinar and go outside in the next month, that's probably the time before all the leaves fall off because leaves provide us a really good clue and they're, Oftentimes not the only thing that you need, but it's a good start. So let's go through some of these. So I'm gonna go into all of these in more detail. I'm just gonna kind of quickly list them, but as far as looking at tree identification through examining the leaves, you first wanna narrow down, is it an evergreen tree or evergreen leaf or is it deciduous? 
what is the arrangement on the branch? Do the leaves come out opposite one another or do they come out alternately? What's the type of leaf? We're gonna go through this in more detail. Is it simple, compound, or palmate? What's the shape? Does it have lobes like an oak leaf? Does it have, a, what kind of leaf margin or edge of the leaf does it have? What's the surface on top and on the underside of the leaf? What are some obvious features that may or may not relate to the leaves? What are the fruits look like? What about the flowers? Does it have thorns? Does it have unique bark? What's the fall color? What are the veins like on the leaf? What does the tip of the leaf look like or the base of the leaf? These are all really important clues to helping you identify a plant. So there's other things, we're gonna go through in more detail this, these number one through five, but there's other features that you can observe and record that we're not gonna go into detail, but I just wanna read through these. So some trees have a certain smell and that could be the flowers, that could be the wood, and so smell is a good indicator of a certain type of tree or certain species. Some trees like sourwood have very sour leaves and that's an indicator. And I don't <laughs> recommend you go and start tasting a bunch of leaves, but if you know a sourwood, you can kind of verify it by like, oh yeah, that's that sour leaf. So that's an indicator. Um, trees have different types of buds. Trees also have different branching patterns and arrangements. So that's uh, important identification information. The scar where the leaf falls off in the fall, those are all really unique on trees. So you can look at leaf scars as an ID feature. Lenticels are where the tree exchanges gas with the atmosphere. And some trees have very unique lenticel patterns. The pseudo-terminal and terminal buds, these are the buds that occur on the end of a branch. And those are very unique. Sometimes on a tree, there are only things that you can see with a hand lens because they're so small. There's some hickory species that have what appear to be like gold glitter on the underside of the, the leaf, on the rachis, and also on the nut of that tree. And you really can't see it without a hand lens. And then there's some common pests and diseases. There's also something called monoecious versus dioecious. Some of you may be familiar with that. Monoecious is when a tree or a plant has a male and female flower on the same tree, whereas dioecious means that the male and female flowers are on separate, tr separate trees. And so persimmon is a good example. It's a dioecious species, meaning that only the female trees are gonna fruit. That's why you might see a persimmon tree and it doesn't have any fruit on it. All right, so let's go through some of these, those, that number one through five that I was just talking about. And we are looking at deciduous versus evergreen. And I have some leaves here on the bottom of the screen. So we have a red maple, Acer rubrum, and a white oak. So deciduous trees or plants lose all of their leaves for a part of the year. And so in the winter time, we're not gonna see these maple and white oak leaves. But evergreen means that the tree or the plant retains leaves throughout the year. Now they're gonna, leave, they're gonna lose those leaves gradually and they'll probably lose them throughout the year or over the course of several years. Some trees will retain leaves for several years, but they eventually lose them over time, even when they're evergreen. So I have this question here. Did you know that most conifer tree species are evergreen? So conifers being pines, arbor vita, um, true cedars, eastern red cedars, junipers, most of them, most, that's italicized, are evergreen but not all evergreens are conifers. So one example is the Southern Magnolia. This is considered an evergreen tree, but it's not a conifer. Now we do have a few rule breakers here. So if anyone's familiar with the bald cypress, this is actually a deciduous conifer. So as you can see, I took this picture on a canoeing trip in the Okefenokee Swamp. This is in the winter, this past February, all of these bald cypress have lost their needles. And so they're just, because they're deciduous, it's not that it's dead. And here is the tree losing its needles. It makes this beautiful coppery color as it's starting to lose them. And so here's an image of bald cypress. There's a few other species, pond cypress. And if you're familiar with Dawn Redwood, they're all deciduous conifers. So those are our rule breakers. Okay, let's move on. Another brief identifiable feature is leaf arrangement. So we talked about this a little bit. We have alternate leaves. So let's imagine this is the branch 
on the tree, we have leaves that come out alternately along that branch. We also have species that have opposite leaves, meaning the leaves come out opposite one another. And then there's another, there's several other types of leaf arrangement, but we also have world leaves, so three leaves coming out in one location. Now there's several species, we have sort of some rule of thumbs, there's several species that either have opposite leaves or alternate leaves. And so these, I want to introduce this, this acronym to you because this helps you further narrow down what is the species that you're looking at. If you see opposite leaves for some example, for one example, you can narrow it down to a group of species. So these are just species that are common in our area. So all of these have opposite leaves and there's this acronym, Big Mad Cap Buck. Big Mad Cap Buck. So what does this mean? Big is the big Naniaceae family. I know it's a <laughs> giant, that's a mouthful of a word there. So big Naniaceae contains the Catalpa tree and the Royal Polonia tree. They have opposite leaves. All maples have opposite leaves. All ash trees have opposite leaves. All dogwoods have opposite leaves. Caprifoliaceae is a family. It's the honeysuckle family, the elderberry family, as well as the viburnum family. They all have have opposite leaves, as well as the buckeye. So some common trees in our areas that all have alternate leaves, so these leaves here are oaks, elms, and hickories. So if you think you're looking at an elm, but it has opposite leaves, it's not an elm, it's something else. Let's look at some examples of this. Okay, so here's an oak species, and if you see on the screen, we've got the leaves coming out alternately. So when I saw this, out on the landscape, I said, oh, that's an oak. I know that's an oak. Well, I had other features that I knew it was an oak, but I knew that it had alternate leaves and so it was most likely an oak. Okay, so I'm just gonna highlight this so you can see that they're coming out alternately. And then here we have a flowering dogwood, Cornus Florida. And you can see here that the leaves come out opposite one another. And I highlighted that there. So moving on to other identifiable features, we have leaf type. Okay, first let's look at this branch here. So this branch has a series of leaves coming out and this is alternate leaf arrangement as we just went over. And you see that there's a bud here, it's called a lateral bud or an axillary bud. And the leaf comes out where this lateral bud is located. So this entire thing is a leaf. This is called the petiole, this is the blade, the entire thing is a leaf. And this is also so where this bud and the leaf come out is called a node. So we have a node indicated right here. So moving to the different leaf types, a simple leaf like an oak, an elm, a maple, just has this simple leaf that comes out. It has a petiole and then the blade comes from the petiole and it comes out of that node. But we have other types of leaves called pinnately compound leaves. So we just have this one petiole coming out. These are not leaves, these are called leaflets. And this is called the rachis. And so this entire thing here, structure here is a leaf. So this is a pinnately compound leaf common in our pecans, hickories, uh, black walnut. They all have pinnately compound leaves because, and you know that this is one leaf because here's the leaf bud and this is the node. So we also have bipinately compound leaves, which is um, displayed here on the far right. And there's also tripinately compound leaves. So it's just a lot of leaflets uh, making up this one leaf. We also have um, trees have, and other plants have palmately compound leaves. So we have our petiole, our leaf stem, and then the leaflets come out at the end of the petiole. And then there's also trifolately compound I didn't pronounce that right, trifolately compound leaves. So that's another type of leaf. Again, each of these are coming out of that one node. So I'm gonna give an example here. So this is a simple leaf, alternately arranged simple leaf. And this is a compound, a pinnately compound leaf. It's just this whole thing is one leaf. So here's some examples. So here we have simple leaf, white oak, Quercus alba. And I've outlined, here's our simple leaf coming out of the one node. 
And then we have our pinnately compound leaf. So here's a pecan, Caria ilianoensis. And you see here is where the node is. And so this entire leaf is one leaf. That's all one leaf, because there's no buds in here. The bud is down here. Now here's a devil wa devil's walking stick. It's another type of tree that we have in the area. This entire thing here, structure, is a leaf. This is called a bipinately compound leaf. We just saw an example of that. So a bipinately compound leaf. And then lastly, we have an example of a palmately compound leaf. This is a buckeye. And I'm gonna circle, that is one leaf right there. So again, these are just providing further clues for identifying a plant. Now we're gonna talk about leaf shape. So there's different shapes of leaf, and this is kind of that, the, the overall shape of the leaf. Elliptical is one of the most common leaf shapes. And so this is our dogwood, Cornus florida. And so this again, this, sometimes it has a pointed tip, sometimes not, so elliptical. We also have oval leaves. Now, again, this is a pinately compound leaf. So this whole leaf is pinately compound and it has oval shaped leaflets. We also have trees that have long and narrow leaves called lancelet. And this is a willow oak, Quercus fellows. But there's several other species that have these types of leaves. We also have heart-shaped leaves, chordate-shaped leaves. And this is our red bud, Cercis canadensis. There's a leaf called palmisect. It's a hand-shaped leaf. This is a sweet gum, Liquidombar styrocyphalua. And there's also asymmetrical leaves. So this is an American elm, and you can see that the leaf base is higher on one side than the other. So it's just another shape. This is, again, it's all clues to look at when you're trying to identify a tree. So now we're gonna look at the leaf margin. Now, when I say leaf margin, I'm talking about this outer edge of the leaf. It's very unique on all trees. So most trees have a smooth or entire leaf margin or leaf edge. That's not true for all, but a lot of trees have this smooth or entire leaf edge. But a lot of other trees also have what's called a serrated edge. And this is sort of this toothed margin. Sometimes we call it single serrations like this. Sometimes it has a big serration and then a small one in between. So this American elm has double serrated, um, a double serrated leaf margin. And this is an American chestnut, has the single serration and then the eastern hophorn beam has the double serration. So that's another common leaf margin. And there's several different types of leaf margins, but this is another example. American holly has a spiny leaf margin. I know many of you, like myself, have been pricked by the, <laughs> the American holly before. And there's like scalloped um, leaf margins. There's um, leaf margins that roll over, they're called revolute, ro roll over on the edge like the live oak. There's several different types. This is just some of the common ones. So next, let's talk about leaf texture. Again, we're gathering more clues. A very common leaf texture, so this can be the top of the leaf or the underside of the leaf is smooth. So it's very smooth um, on either side. So it's very common leaf texture. Another somewhat common leaf texture is called pubescence. And I put hairy in quotes. It's technically not hairy though. That's, that's technically wrong to say that, but a lot of people describe it as that, that way, as you, you feel either the surface, the top surface of the leaf or the underside of the leaf, and it feels soft, like there's fuzz on it. And that's called pubescence. And so here's our slippery elm, Elmus ruba and rubra, and you can tell it apart from American elm because of this pubescence on the underside of the leaves. There's also leaves that are rough, it's called scabrous. This is a red mulberry, Morris rubra, and you can tell it, tell the difference between a red mulberry and a white mulberry, which is an introduced species, because the red mulberry has a scabrous 
top leaf surface, whereas the white mulberry does not. It has a smooth leaf surface. And then we have another type of leaf surface, which is shiny, sometimes called glabrescent. And the American holly also has sort of a waxy leaf surface, which is another type of texture to the leaf. So looking at brief identifiable features, again, we're looking at lobed versus unlobed leaves. So this, is, this can be maples, this can also be oaks primarily. And so I have some oak images here, an overcup oak and northern red oak. And I put these up here because they demonstrate different types of lobes. So these are good examples. So lobes are what's outlined in red here. And we have some here. And then what's called sinuses are what are in between the lobes. Now sinuses can either be deep. So this is a good example. Overcup oak has deep sinuses, whereas northern red oak has shallow sinuses. This is a very important identification distinction when you're looking at different types of oaks especially, is do they have deep sinuses or shallow sinuses? And that really helps you narrow down the oak species. You can also look at the number of lobes that a leaf has. And sometimes, you know, you look in a tree ID book and it says five to seven lobes. So it gives you sort of a general guideline to go by. But not all leaves, as we've seen, are lobed. Some leaves are unlobed, like our dogwood leaf that we saw earlier, and our black gum leaf. Some of these other features that we went over, and this is sort of the last, um, the last bit that we're going to review here as far as brief identifiable features. Fruits are pretty obvious. Uh, here's a persimmon fruit here, Diospyros, Diospyros virginiana. Flowers are also very distinctive. This is beautiful redbud flowering in the spring. Sometimes you have really distinctive bark or fall color. Both of these are from the sourwood tree. Um, I, I think. I think sourwoods, I would actually love to put one of these in my yard. They just have unbelievable fall color, just beautiful. Now some trees have thorns or spines. And so this is a good ID feature and trying to narrow down what this tree is. It's important to look at the venation, venation of a leaf. And so here, this is the leaf vein. This is called palmate venation and it's typical on maple leaves. So the veins sort of fan out from the base of the leaf, as you see here. And this is called pinate venation. And so you have this mid rib, this midline here, main vein down the, the center of the leaf, and then sort of sub veins come off the side of that. So you can see how this American elm leaf is very different from this red maple. And these, again, are all clues to help you identify what this tree species is. There's also differences in leaves, leaf tip and base. So the tip being here, it can be long and pointed, or it can be sort of slightly rounded over in this black locus here on this leaflet. The base varies dramatically. Um, sometimes the base can be called truncate, and it's sort of flat at the bottom of the leaf. We don't have an example here. Uh, sometimes it's bell-shaped, like in a southern red oak. Sometimes it's V-shaped, like in our willow oak we saw in the lancelet leaf. So it just varies. Again, with your notebook and your camera, just take pictures of all of this. And that can help you further identify the tree. So now we're going to move on to some specific species. And I am interested in species that would be applicable to where you all live. And this also works for where I live. And so I put this star on the map, and this is generally locating, at least based on Google Maps, where I thought Forsyth County might be, maybe a little too far north or too far south, I'm not sure, but I think Athens is over here somewhere. But generally, you're sort of in this foothills region, and you're not in the Blue Ridge or the Ridge and Valley, but we're still in the Piedmont, but you're starting to probably get a lot of elevation change here as you're moving into the Blue Ridge, but you still, Similar species occur in the Blue Ridge and the foothills in the Piedmont, but we're going to focus on Piedmont species. And again, we're going to talk about some of their wildlife allies. Our first species you may 
recognize. This is tulip poplar. It's also called yellow poplar. And the dash in between those two words is important because this is not a true poplar. A true poplar is in the populus genus. This is, um, I'm, I don't know the history or the origin of this name, but I'm assuming that someone must have thought that it was related to poplar initially. So I'm not gonna go too far down that trail because I don't know the history of it, but uh, the genus species of this tree is called Liriodendron tulipifera. And of course the tulip is in the common name, but the tulip also relates to this really unique flower that tulip poplar has. And this blooms sort of in the early summer, late spring, early summer. It's a flower that's about two inches across. It's mostly yellow, but it also has orange and green on it. You've probably seen these laying on the forest floor more than you see them on the tree, unless you have a smaller tree. So this is very unique to this tree. Once this flower sort of loses all of its petals, it's left with this, um, this it's called, they're called Samaras, all of these sort of dry, it's a type of fruit, it's a dry fruit. And these begin to fall off through the season. And what's left in the winter time, this is a good ID characteristic in the winter, is just this one, it almost looks like a unicorn horn, this one piece that's left and it'll be all over the tree. All the leaves will be gone and you'll have just this one Samara left right here. So in the growing season though, another unique feature are the tulip shaped leaves. People also think this looks like a cat face. And so that's another way to think about it. Here's the ears, here's the whiskers. So tulip shaped leaves, they have an enormous buds, giant buds. This is in the magnolia family. So this is all related to the magnolia, which also has very large buds and really showy flowers. So we've got some good ID features here, the Samara, the flowers, the tulip shaped leaves. And the bark is generally gray it, um, as it gets older. It's smooth when it's younger, like a maple, but then as it gets older, it gets more of this forked furrowed bark. But a unique feature on tulip poplars are these sort of upside down U's on the bark that this orange arrow is pointing towards. That's, this goes right over where a branch used to be. And so this is a sort of a unique feature there. But let's talk about how tulip poplar is beneficial to wildlife. So <clears throat> tulip poplar is an important nectar source for several pollinators, butterflies, bees, and birds. So specifically um, hummingbirds and birds like cedar waxwings feed on the nectar from the flowers. It's also a larval host plant for several um, butterflies. So I've included some here. We have our Eastern tiger swallowtail, spicebush swallowtail and viceroy. And so these are um, a larval host plant. Uh, this is a larval host plant for these butterflies. White-tailed deer, gray squirrels, and some songbirds also eat the flowers in the spring. And then twigs on young trees can provide deer browse. Oh, one of my favorites here, hickory. So I'm not gonna get down to the species level. This is the genus, so carrier species, because we have numerous species of hickories in Georgia. The most common ones in the Piedmont are what are called pignut hickory and mockernut hickory. And here's pignut hickory nuts down here. So let's see, some features of hickory. It tends to have this, these ridges of bark and they are often forked. Now hickory tends to have one solid trunk. It doesn't split off as much as some of the oaks do where it has multiple um, what are called leaders. So it tends to have this one solid stem reaches high up into the canopy, they can grow up to 140 feet tall. Now we talked about the, the pinately compound leaf. So here is the node here, this is one entire leaf. So hickories have pinately compound leaves, something to remember, and they are alternate, they're not opposite. Only our ash has, has opposite pinately compound leaves. So this is a lovely yard tree. And there's a different types of nuts here, and we'll talk about the wildlife that love these nuts. But one distinction you're going to see hickory coming up here in the fall is that it is the most vibrant yellow tree that you're going to see high up in the canopy in natural areas. So this is really distinctive. You're like, oh, that's a hickory. You may not know what species it is, but you know it's a hickory. It has these compound, beautiful sort of lemon yellow leaves. 
let's talk about the wildlife benefits of hickory. So hickory is a host plant for a few different types of butterflies and moths. And I'm gonna include two here. So we have, um, so, and this is for their caterpillars. So we have the banded hair streak and also um, the luna moth is attracted. And this is again, the, the caterpillars are attracted to the hickory tree, but there's also a really unique uh, butter, or moth and caterpillar that's attracted to this tree. And it's called the hickory horn devil. And you can see the different colors here and the sort of the projections off, off of the caterpillar and it makes this beautiful large moth. So this is a special tree for the hickory horn devil. And these appear in May to mid-September. So lastly, the nuts are eaten by squirrels, chipmunks, black bears, deer, foxes, mice, wood ducks, hogs, and even humans, if you can crack them open. They're very delicious. So that's our hickory tree. Okay, so we're going to one of our early pole plants here, black gum, Nysa sylvatica. I already have the wildlife benefits on there, but let's talk about uh, tree ID first. So Nysa sylvatica or black gum tends to have one solid trunk, single trunk like the hickory, and its branches come off. This is a very distinctive characteristic at 90 degree angles from the trunk. So this is one way that you can identify or distinguish, differentiate this tree from other trees that look similar. So 90 degree angles and even it's little branchlets. So it has these little branchlets with um, what appear to be like little whorls of leaves, but they're actually simple leaves, individual leaves. And they come off about, about at 90 degree angle, angles from this branch here. So we're looking at, that's a unique feature with the, bran the branch structure, the structure of the tree, and then also these little branchlets or twigs rather, sorry. The bark is sort of, described as alligator hide. Um, it can, just like some of our other native trees, it's not the most distinctive characteristic, but I put it in here just so you could see what it looks like. Uh, the leaf shape is pretty distinctive. The fruits that we went over, there are not a lot of trees that have these types of fruits. Um, and they're sort of purplish, a quarter to a half inch long. But one thing that is distinctive about this tree is its fall color. It's one of our early changing trees and it turns this sort of reddish salmon color. And you see it out right now. It's before other trees are changing, this one has already jumped the gun, it's ahead of the game. So as far as benefits of the black gum to wildlife, the young sprouts are eaten by white-tailed deer, so it's a good browse for them. And the berries are enjoyed by thrushes and other songbirds, wild turkeys, black bear, foxes, raccoons, and opossums. I just said that wrong, it's possums. <laughs> Not, well, actually, I don't know. Do you say opossums or possums? You guys can let me know that in the chat box. <laughs> so the tree also has a lot of natural hollows that attract some other diverse wildlife like reptiles, tree frogs, bats, and other types of wildlife. And then the spring flowers are a good nectar source for bees. So moving on to our red maple, Acer rubrum. So if anyone wants to put in the chat box, I'm not really following the chat box, I'm sorry, because I'm presenting, but if anyone wants to put in whether they think this has alternate or off opposite leaves, maybe Heather can monitor that. But, okay, so in this image, we're gonna talk about some of the ID features first, and then we'll go into some of these uh, uh, wildlife benefits. So ID features is this has a one of those um, palmisect leaf shapes. So it's kind of this palmate, it looks like a hand a little bit, but the red maple only has three of these. And this is a lobe. We talked about lobed and unlobed. So it has three primary lobes. And this sinus, remember the area between the lobes, is not very deep. And this is one way to distinguish it from a silver maple. Silver maples have very deep sinuses, but otherwise the trees look similar. Also, you'll notice that it has a serrated edge on the leaf, leaf margin. So a serrated leaf margin. And this is how you distinguish it from a sugar maple. A sugar maple does not have serrations. It's entirely smooth. 
as a smooth leaf margin, whereas red maple has a serrated leaf margin. Red maple is a stunning um, fall tree, it has beautiful fall color. A lot of people put it in their yard for this reason. It also has these great fall fruits and red flowers in the early spring. It's one of the first trees that flowers in the, um, in the late winter, mid to late winter. And the bark is kind of the smooth gray bark when it's younger and it gets a little bit furrowed as it gets older, but it's like a kind of a light gray. All right, so let's talk about some wildlife benefits. As you can see in some of these images, the um, tree supports the imperial moth larvae. And these uh, moths appear around eight, April to October in, in our part of the country. And the fruit, which is here, along with the buds, are a primary food source for gray squirrels in the late winter. So when they don't have a lot of other things to eat, they can eat these, which is great. And the seeds are enjoyed by birds. So the seeds are within these little helicopter um, samaras. Sprouts are a favorite food for white-tailed deer, but this, this tree is fairly resistant to deer damage, but when it's smaller, they can be eaten. And then the flower nectar attracts honeybees and other pollinators. So um, as a beekeeper, I'm really excited when the red maple starts flowering because I know that the bees are gonna have um, flowers to work at that point and as they're starting to run out of their own honey supplies. All right, so hornbeams. These are, there are two different types of hornbeams in our region and they grow almost side by side. Um, these are gonna be found down in sort of wet, moist areas and some identifying characteristics. And I put these together because I want to distinguish the two of them. This is an Eastern hop hornbeam. This is an American hornbeam. And the Eastern hop hornbeam has what we call cat scratch bark. It looks like a cat's been scratching all over the side of it. Whereas you see the American hornbeam has this really smooth, almost muscly looking bark. It's actually called ironwood um, or muscle wood because it looks like, like a well muscled arm or leg. So that's pretty distinctive of that tree. The leaves look somewhat similar, kind of this elliptical shape with a long point and they have double serrations, which is sort of similar on both leaves, but the flowers and fruits are different. So this looks like a hop flower, like a hop that would be used to make beer. Whereas this flower has these um, sort of, uh, I'm trying to remember, nutlets on the side coming out from, um, from the fruit here. And so this is a very distinctive, if you catch them in flower, this is a very distinctive flower compared to this hop-like flower and the bark is also distinctive. So we'll talk about some wildlife benefits of the, the hornbeams. These are both native trees. So the hornbeams are a larval host for the Eastern tiger swallowtail, which we already saw an image of, and the red spotted purple, which is here. And it um, provides seed and buds, or the seed and buds provide a food source for songbirds, um, other birds called like rust grouse, quail, wild turkey, as well as foxes and squirrels. And then on some of the young specimens, the inner bark is eaten by beavers and rabbits as a food source. And then these plants also provide really good cover and shelter for wildlife. Our next tree is the white oak. <clears throat> And this is probably very distinctive for all of you. Um, some good ID features of this tree is the bark. It has these long sort of sloughed off ridges um, and, or I don't wanna call them ridges. They're more like flakes of bark. It almost seems like it's peeling and this goes high up into the canopy. And this is more common to see on older specimens. The acorns are pretty unique. They have what we call a warty cap. And then the leaf, has these rounded lobes with deep sinuses. And each of these lobes point toward the top of the leaf. So each of these lobes point toward the top of the leaf. So let's talk about <clears throat> some wildlife benefits. Okay, so this is a great tree for moths. And I wanted to talk about some of these moths. So I'm gonna go ahead and put all these images up. So it, it as well attracts the imperial moth. Um, it also attracts, attracts the banded hair streak, which we saw an image of, and some other hair streaks like the Edwards hair streak, um, gray hair streak, and white hair streak. And it also attracts some dusty wings. And this one, it's, they, it attracts horses dusty wing and also juveniles dusky, dusky wing, which we have an image of here. 
And the acorns are eaten by a variety of animals, including uh, birds like woodpeckers, blue jays, small mammals, wild turkey, deer. We have some deer eating acorns here and also black bear. So it's an excellent protein, um, high quality uh, food source for all sorts of animals. Even humans can eat them if they leach out the tannins. Our next tree we're gonna talk about is service berry. And the service berry, this is Amelanchier arborea. This is another native tree as all of these are. And this is kind of a smaller size tree. Um, it can get to be about 20, maybe 20 feet into the canopy. Uh, it's usually a multi-stemmed trunk, as you see in this image here. It has beautiful orange to red fall color, and then it has this kind of blueberry looking fruit, which is very delicious. So let's talk about, um, let me talk about a few other parts of this, uh, some of the identification. The flowers are gorgeous, white, beautiful white flowers covering the tree in the spring that lead to these fruits. The leaf has these very delicate fine serration on the edge of the leaf and has kind of this oval elliptical shape. The leaf is smooth and green on the top, but then it's white on the underside. And then they have these long pointy buds, which I've highlighted right here. And the bark is kind of this brownish gray and people describe it as having stretch, mark, stretch marks on it. And you, when you get close to it, it, it does sort of look like that, that it has stretch marks. Okay, so wildlife benefits. All right, so you can imagine the berries are gonna benefit a lot and that's actually something we're gonna talk about the most. So this benefits um, the red spotted purple butterfly, which we saw, but it's its larvae that it supports. And so, um, so that's probably gonna be in leaf matter, but also it's a nectar source with these flowers for butterflies, pollinators, and other insects. And the fruits are eaten by songbirds, small and large mammals, as we see down here. And I believe this may be our last species. Let's see, we've got one more after that and then we'll finish. Okay, so black walnut, which many of you are probably familiar with, Juglans nigra. This is a beautiful tree. Um, this has our pinnately compound leaves. Um, the leaves are, as many of these, we've gone through our deciduous and they're very pungent when they're crushed. There's a slight pubescence or quote unquote hairiness on the other side of the leaves and these leaves lack a terminal leaflet here at the bottom, like, like our pecan does. So that's one way you can distinguish it from pecan. So th these green nuts, which are also very pungent smelling, are two and a half inches across. They're quite large. And the bark is black. These are very tall trees, very important wood quality, um, our, our hardwood tree for wood. So some of the wildlife benefits, this plant supports moth and butterfly larvae. Um, it also supports the hickory horn devil, which we talked about. And um, it's a larval host for the banded hair streak and the luna moth, which we already talked about. And then the meat of the nut is really a favorite of squirrels, as you can see one here with it right now. And then our last tree is the black cherry, Prunus serotina. And several of you are probably familiar with this, just some brief ID characteristics. Uh, the leaves are kind of slightly elliptical, oblong. They have a slight serration on the edge of the leaf and they're very smooth and almost waxy feeling. Alternate leaf arrangement. One thing that's distinctive about the twig, if you, if you take your nail and you rub the twig on the top here, you're gonna get the smell of almond. That's how you know you have a cherry, is it smells like, um, yeah, it's kind of like an almondy smell. And uh, that's actually the, the smell of hydrocyanatic cyanatic acid. I'm probably mispronouncing that. So something you don't want to eat, but um, it's, that's that almond smell. The bark on young trees is kind of smooth. Um, it has a lot of lenticels, those gas exchange um, structures I was telling you about. But as the tree gets older, it has what we call burnt cornflake bark. So if any of you put your cornflakes in the microwave and burn them, that's what it's gonna look like. <laughs> I'm sure nobody does that, but so young smooth bark when, they're, when it's a young tree or young branch, and then this burnt cornflake bark as it gets older, has beautiful white flowers in the spring that cover the, the plant. 
and then it has all of these fruits that are kind of bitter, but you know, these are, it's a wonderful wildlife attracting plant. So let's talk about some of those benefits. So this tree supports butterfly larvae. And I'm just gonna talk about some of those. Um, it supports the coral hair streak, um, the Eastern tiger swallowtail, and this is the spring azure, a viceroy and red spotted purple. And we've seen images of those. Actually, I think there might be one tree after this. I'll go through that because that's when we go over the coral hair streak. It's a great um, nectar source for pollinators. The fruits are eaten by songbirds, wild turkey, quail, white-tailed deer, and small mammals. And okay, I promise this is our last species. <laughs> I remember going through this. All right, so our Eastern red cedar, great tree, um, very distinctive. We call it um, shreddy bark because it's always peeling. Incredibly fragrant wood fragrant berries. Um, this used to help flavor gin, so it has that gin smell to it. Um, these are not called, I'm sorry, I called them berries. That was incorrect to me. These are actually called fleshy cones. They're not berries, though they're often referred to them because this is an evergreen and it has cones. Um, the leaves on young trees are kind of blue-green and spiky, but as they get older, they have these scale-like green leaves. And so the benefits of this tree is it supports the juniper hair streak larvae. So here's the, um, the adult specimen of that. So it supports the larvae. And then the fleshy cones, correcting myself, they're eaten by a variety of birds. Here's a, a purple finch and a robin, um, squirrels, lots of songbirds. So this is, and it's just a tree that provides shelter too. I mean, this is evergreen tree. So it's a wonderful tree that provides a lot of benefits. Oh gosh, I lied, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's see, we have five minutes left. So <clears throat> I think that I'll wrap, Heather, I'm gonna wrap this one up because I don't wanna go over the time. I know everybody's time is precious unless people are willing to go maybe five minutes over, but Heather, if you can maybe navigate that through the chat box. Sure. So far, we have no questions in the chat box. So if you just want to go, I mean, if you have to leave, um, we appreciate you being here. Um, and Holly, go ahead and, and move on through. I know you've got a couple other polls to get to us as well. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, okay, we have our American Holly. This is Ilex Opeka. My namesake here. Uh, it's a great tree. It has these evergreen leaves with spiny leaf margins, very waxy, shiny leaf surface. These really small white flowers in the spring. Uh, these would be on the um, primarily the female tree. So this is a dioecious tree, meaning it has male and female trees. So only the female trees are going to have um, the berries. So there's probably a male flower as well. And I'm not sure if this is the male or the female flower. The bark is smooth and gray. The tree can get to be about 60 feet tall, so it's, um, it's actually quite a, a large tree, one of our largest hollies. So let's talk about some wonderful wildlife benefits of this tree, and I've got several images here. So this tree is a larval host plant for Henry's elfin larvae, which appear from February to May. Um, this is kind of an interesting uh, uh, larval. I, I found this little red caterpillar unique here. So they're both of the same. I don't know if one's older than the other. And then the flowers provide nectar for honeybees. So this is a great tree for beekeepers. Um, and the adult Henry's elfin butterflies feed on the flower nectar as well. So these would be feeding on the flower nectar. Fruits are eaten by songbirds, wild turkeys, as you see this wild turkey jumping up, quail, white-tailed deer, squirrels, and other small mammals. And then as, as the um, eastern red cedar, this is evergreen, so it provides great cover during the, wil the, during the winter and shelter for not only nesting, but also shelter from the elements. I wanted to say one brief word on taxonomy. So I know I didn't go through taxonomy, but there's a lot of different common names and some species can have 20 different common names. And this can lead to a lot of confusion determining what it is that you're looking at. And so it's really important to try to remember the importance of taxonomy and knowing the genus species of names. And so once you figure that out, maybe jot them down and just kind of have a mental note of what you think they may be, if anything, the genus of them. So um, every organism is given a scientific name. 
We have genus and species, which this is called a binomial nomenclature. And so a human, as we know, is Homo sapiens. So that's genus, species, Homo sapiens, cat, Felis catus. We went over our tulip poplar. It's Liriodendron tulipifera. Um, I put this in as kind of a joke because a lot of celebrities have had animals named after them. And uh, this was a special beetle that was called Agra, I'm gonna mispronounce this, Swartznegrii or Neg Negrii, right? I'm going to say that wrong. <laughs> but yeah, even Arnold Schwarzenegger had a beetle named after him. So, you know, you may too have one named after you. So let's go through and just test finally what you learned through the webinar. So this is species that we went over and some that we had in the beginning. And I'm going to pull up another one of our polls and you just let me know what you think it is. Move this over there so you can see it. And holly well folks are answering that we do have a question in the chat box about the american hollies uh, someone is asking is that also are american holly trees also a bush um it's it's pruned into a bush but american holly always becomes a larger tree if allowed to grow let me um let me pause on that answering that question though Okay, so we're gonna, I'm gonna end the polling and share these results. It looks like most people indeed said it was a sugar maple, uh, I'm sorry, a red maple. One reason why it's not a sugar maple is because this is serrated on the edge, whereas uh, sugar maple has a smooth edge. Okay, we're gonna go to our next plant and I'm gonna start the poll here. And you guys can tell me what you think this is. Okay, so yeah, the, the American holly, um, if they're hybrids of the American holly, which I think that there are a few, it could be bred to be a slightly smaller species, but there's other hollies like Burford holly, um, um, Molly Stevens, I think, uh, Emily Bruner, those are our species that are uh, smaller. They're not American holly, but they're other species or hybrids that are smaller hollies. Okay, it looks like everyone got that right. Tulip poplar, excellent job, excellent job. Okay, and now we're gonna go to our next, <clears throat> next tree here and I'm gonna put up the poll and you can tell me what you think this is. Got our burnt cornflake bark here. Berries that the wildlife love. All right, I'm gonna end the polling. And you guys did a nice job. It is a black cherry, definitely a black cherry. The, um, the berries of service berry look a little bit different. They look like blueberries. They're larger, um, pinkish red, mature to sort of a blueberry color. Um, the bark on service berry is a little bit different. Um, this, the black cherry is what has the burnt cornflake bark. Um, service berry has that stretch bark, kind of light grayish brown bark. All right, and I believe I have one more, and this is kind of just testing knowledge, seeing what you learned, and I'm going to put up this last poll. This is kind of just more for my information, and um, I'm just curious, did this help you learn any about tree ID, um, where you feel a little bit more confident with the information? Holly, is that black cherry what I grew up calling a choke cherry? No, a choke cherry is something different. It's a different species. It's still a prunus, a prunus genus, but um, I'd have to look up the, the species. I'm not sure which one that is. Okay, well, great, everybody. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm, I'm not necessarily gonna share those results, but it seemed like most people felt like they learned something. Um, we got out of the, I have no tree ID knowledge. So that's excellent. Thank you so much.
Okay, so my last slide here just has some recommended resources. I'm happy to share my slides with you so you can have a copy of this. And I really love native trees of the Southeast and this includes some wildlife uses. Um, this is a great website if you want images to help you identify trees. They also have animals on them as well. Uh, so uh, Will Cook has put this together. Uh, selecting trees and shrubs as resources for pollinators. This is a great cooperative extension publication that UGA put out. And um, I really like North Carolina State University has something called the Gardener Plant Toolbox. And this is sort of a decision support tool. It helps you look up species and it provides a, a plethora of information about that species, everything from um, biological, physiological characters of the species and also um, wildlife characteristics. There's, there's a whole host of information. And if anyone would like to get in touch with me, I'm happy to take any questions via email. That's usually the best way to reach me over the phone. So I just put my email address here. Well, Holly, that, thank you. Thank you very much for being with us today. Very informative. Um, I'm sure we all learned something. I always do. Um, so last chance for questions in the chat box. And if you did not, if you joined late and did not put your name in the chat box, please go ahead and do that now. Yeah, someone had um, made a, I'm just looking at the chat box right now. I haven't looked at it until now. And that's a good question from uh, Steve or good comment. Red maple usually has a red petiole. You know, it's interesting. Um, that is sometimes the case uh, my colleagues and I noticed that that occurs more in really sunny locations. And so we think that that pigment is a, um, is a way to protect the petiole. And so you'll look in some shady areas and, and the petiole isn't red on the leaf. And so it's, it's not a sure proof characteristic, but it's, it's like you said, it's a very common way to look at a red maple, but uh, silver maple also does the same thing. So we end up having to look at some other features. Heather, would you like me to stop recording now? Oh, I guess, actually, I think you might have to stop recording, Heather, because <laughs> it'll go to my computer unless you do. Thanks, everybody. It was great to be here. I, I appreciate all the comments. And I will definitely share my presentation. Okay. And.